Hello everyone, welcome back to Soccer 60. This is episode 2 of the Soccer 60 podcast brought to you by Little D. What is Soccer 60? Soccer 60 is a youth footballing podcast where we bring you coaches and those in the industry to get to know them more and dissect more about the industry as a whole. Now, Towards the end of the show, we'll be recording some of your questions uh, and also answering them. I don't know why I said recording uh, because I'll be saying it. Uh, so be sure to send them in via our social media platforms, which is <laughs> at Little League Soccer MY on Facebook and Instagram. In this podcast, you are joined by me, Henry Chu, Andy Johnston. And today, we have the founder of Little League Soccer, Paul Macefield. Hi, Andy and Mace. How are you guys doing? Morning. I'm very good, Henry. And uh, I'm pleased to see that we're not re-recording this episode today, but you did still manage to mess up the intro. So you haven't got it right yet. <laughs> we, baby steps, baby steps, baby steps. Paul, Paul Macefield. How are you doing today? Hope, sp- hope springs eternal. Don't worry, Henry. You'll get it right one day. Ah, fingers crossed. Just don't talk about badminton, please. Then we'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to the first episode. <laughs> um, now, before we get cracking onto the main agenda, uh, uh, Andy, I almost said agenda will bring us to the speed. Uh, Andy will bring us speed. <sighs> Andy, don't, Andy won't bring us speed. Andy will bring us up to speed. To and Henry, I, I yeah. feel like this is going to be a rough episode for you. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I didn't have uh, a good night's sleep last night, but it's okay. We'll power through. Um, Andy, you have some news about what Little League is up to? Yeah, I mean, obviously, as you know, we've been shut down with the, the COVID-19 crisis for the past six weeks now, but we've tried to stay as busy as we possibly can trying to put out as much um, useful content for people as, as, as possible during this time. So we've got a few things ongoing. Um, of course, we've got the live online training sessions, which for the moment are taking the place of the, the regular weekend trainings. So they happen every Saturday and Sunday morning, 9 a.m. We have a, a coach to student ratio of one coach to every 15 kids. Um, we have five different age groups from under eight, uh, sorry, under six all the way through to under 16. Um, one hour sessions in your living room all you need is a football potentially a pair of socks or a water bottle to act as a marker but a great way to still carry on practicing your football during this period Um, and our coaches are getting more and more used to delivering those those sessions under the restricted circumstances so do get involved with them they're fantastic Um, we do have a free taster session every wednesday afternoon four o'clock that runs it's a 30 minute session just to give you an idea of what the weekends are going to be like run by one of our coaches each week you can hop onto that it's it's a free trial so nothing to nothing to waste there get on there give it a go see if you like it um in addition to that we're putting out daily videos onto our youtube channel um each each week we have a different coach that demonstrates five different skills um with one different skill each day uh so they're really interesting just to log on there learn some new skills whilst you're in the in the lockdown period and hopefully you'll have something to show off to your friends when you get back out onto the pitch uh one more piece of news from our end um we're also started selling our whiteout jerseys these are special limited editions of our four different training centers so there's a whiteout version of bandar tama melawati eco ardents and university malaya um we're, we're selling those at 100 ringgit per shirt they're really great designs and the best thing about it is that 50 percent of all the proceeds are going to be heading towards mercy malaysia to help the covid 19 fund so some great stuff that's going on with us, despite the fact that we're locked down and can't get out onto the field. And if you're interested in any of these, then just uh, please log on to our website, www.littleleague.my. Yep. And that is all f- of the Little League current news that we have for you in this week. Now on to our show. So to start things off, like last week, we had um, our guests explain their kit that they're wearing. So Mace, you have a uh, England top on. Uh, what does that jersey mean to you? Well, it actually came, you'll laugh, from Malaysia. Oh. Because a few years ago, we were doing the KL5s, um, which was a five-a-side tournament, futsal tournament, that was held with the likes of Brazil, um, Argentina. All the top teams in the world came to play in it. And England were there and playing in it. Now, I got quite friendly with the England coaches, um, and I helped them out with a few bits and bobs. And because I helped them out, they gave me one of the official match day jerseys. So Ooh. I've got an official England kit. So I thought I'd wear that one today because, well, just because I can. <laughs> little interesting <laughs> little interesting side story to that KL5s. Um, I went to watch that with my family. And uh, there, was a, there was a guy playing for, for England at the time. 
I cannot remember his name. Um, I believe his name was Luke, uh, who's playing as a striker. And the name sounded very familiar, especially to my dad and to my brother. And they were watching throughout the tournament and he started to look familiar. The more and more they said the name, it sounded more familiar. And it turns out it was someone that actually used to play in Ian's football team when we were younger. And he had, oh. <laughs> uh, ended up coming, coming all the way over to Malaysia and representing Malaysia for the KL, uh, sorry, representing England for the KL5s competition. So uh, that was caught us by surprise. We certainly weren't expecting it. And had somebody that we had lost contact with many, many years ago, um, but was uh, very interesting to us. So yeah, remember that fondly. Uh, do you still keep in contact with Luke? I'm saying Luke. I don't know whether that's his name. <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember. Well, that would be we got the answer. H. We got the answer H. that we want. <laughs> yeah. Moving on swiftly to the very first segment of our show, which is a little bit of an <coughs> introduction to Paul Mace Field. Uh, Mace, why don't you give a brief background on yourself and how you got yourself started into football back home in England? Well, I, I think it was the only thing that you used to do, wasn't it, when you were when you were young and growing up back there? I ended up kicking the ball around, been in, in, involved, in and around, involved in football since about the age of five, six years old, um, and just never looked back. Used to play Sunday League, used to play for the school, represent the school, the districts, um, all the way through the age groups before going on and signing as apprentice at Birmingham City, and then managed to go and sign professional forms with a few clubs over there as well. So. Yeah, it was just a, a pathway and something that I always wanted to do. So there was never going to be a doubt that I would play football, but it just depended at what level. All right. So when, when you started at uh, five or six years old, what, what kind of form was that? Was it in a structured academy or was it just kickabouts with your friends or how did it take the, take shape? Um, it used to, I used to play for a team called Dunlop Terriers. And they used to train on Fridays and play on Sundays. So that was that was the one. Then I'd play up an age group as well. So I'd be playing in two age groups. Um, then I'd, I'd be playing for the school, and I'd be playing up up a couple of age groups in that as well. So I mean, it wasn't really properly structured like things are now, but there, there was that little bit of structure there, purely and simply from the point of um, for training on a Friday to, to playing on a Sunday. I remember that the training on Friday nights <clears throat> rings rings a bell with me. I remember when I was around that sort of age and we were training on Friday nights. It in the winter, obviously in the UK, it gets dark at four o'clock, and mm. it used to require people yeah. to park all their cars overlooking the field, and everyone turned on their headlights on their cars, and we trained under those lights on a Friday <laughs> evening. That was floodlights oh. for us back then. <laughs> we, and, we were and, lucky. We had an indoor. We had an indoor gym. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> And fish and chips on the way home. Friday night was always a fish and chip night. Oh. <laughs> how, how old would you say you were before you started to experience any sort of structure to the trainings? Blimey. Um, it's, it's a really tough one, that, Andy. Because, I mean, when, when you look at the schools, I mean, there was nothing there with the schools. When, when you look at the professional clubs, I've been going in and out of professional teams since about the age of 10, 11 years old. There was structure there, um, but not as structured as as what you see now in in the academies and the academy setup. They were more like centres of excellence, which was you would come in, you would train. If you do a week, it'd be a week's holiday camp. Um, if it was a day here or there, it would it would just be a training day, and that would be it for an hour, an hour and a half. So that I mean, the real structure didn't come. I mean, I didn't see it until I actually started working. This is going to sound daft because I was doing the academies as well. Till, till I was about sixteen, and I, w wow. I ended up coaching some of the some of the kids at Birmingham. And it, it was just that was the only time that you could see that little bit of structure. So, up until then, th there was very very little structure if you compare it to now. In in place, it was. People signed schoolboy forms, that was it. You know, you're, all, you're going to sign a schoolboy form. If you signed a schoolboy form, that usually meant that you'd go on and you'd play for the club and there wouldn't be an issue or a problem. So that was sort of a gimme. Um, but structure-wise for coaching, it was just, you just go and play. Yeah, that's amazing. Mm. Completely different to modern-day football. Yeah. It, it's, it, it, it's, it is totally, honestly, I can't begin to tell you how, how much of chalk and cheese it is. It really is, because you look at the academies now, particularly here in Asia, and you look at them in the UK, 
and you look at all the work that goes in behind the scenes and the preparation and everything that's done there. I mean, I remember having to go, there was a place called Fox Hollies and I would be coaching the under, I ended up coaching the under nines when I was a 15, 16 year old lad at Birmingham City. And I'd have an hour with them a week. And that was it, I'd have an hour. So I'd, that would be it for until, until the holidays. Then they would come in in the afternoons because obviously all the, the first team and the, and the apprentices all, co all, all trained in the mornings. So then you'd get the young kids in in the afternoon and, and then you'd work with them again. So the, the structure wasn't really there. It wasn't really there. Hmm. All right. Uh, but we, let, then let's just point back into the playing career of former Eastfield. I'm going to throw out two names, Paul. Um, Alan Shearer and David Moyers. How do you remember them through your playing days in England? Well, I mean, I, I played with Alan when I was coming up as a kid at Southampton. So, I mean, he's a lovely lad, great lad. And in that team, there was a lad called Jeff Kenner as well. Mm. So he was a Republic of Ireland international. Yeah, that Alan, who was obviously an England international, they're both skipper for their national teams. I mean, we had a we had a heck of a good team, really. A lad called Paul Masters was another one there. Driscoll, Ban Banger, Nicky Banger, he scored on his debut for Southampton. I mean, that was a heck of a side and I was lucky enough to, to play in. Um, you know, is what can you say? I mean, Alan went on and was always going to be a massive success. Mm. He was an August birthday, so he could flip between age groups um, which was good for him. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you can't, not what he's done in the game, an absolute wonderful ambassador to football, which is, which is great to see. Moisey, I played with Moisey at uh, Preston. Um, yep. Yeah, I mean, he was, he was a good lad. Good lad, no problems. Had a heck of a, a slice when it came to his golf swing. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but no, I mean, he, he, was, he was very commanding and someone who was dominant and, and you always knew that he would be uh, going into coaching in a, in a serious mm. manner uh, at mm. some stage you know I mean I was playing alongside him at fullback so he was playing at centre back so you just knew that uh, that Moisey had that presence to be able to go and uh, oh, you see where he is now at West Ham so fair play to him. You've obviously yep. touched upon two names there uh, Mace who were obviously destined for great things at a young age, and you clearly saw that whilst you were playing with them. But we know when we when we coach now youngsters that kids develop at all different stages. Was there anybody that stood out at the time of you being in the academies who who never really fulfilled their potential? Do you think? Oh, there was Apart a lad from yourself, Ronnie, uh, well, <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, that's one. There was a, there was a lad called there was a lad called Ronnie Morris. Um, and, and I mean, this lad was a nutter, an absolute nutter, a proper, so you're, proper mate. Your best mate, your best mate. Oh, no, 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 no. He, he, he turned up at training one day with a dog. He turned up with a dog, right? And, and the coach said to me, he said, what, what, what are you doing? What you got the dog for? He said, he says, no, 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 he says, it's my dog. He said, I've had to bring my dog to work. He said, what, what do you mean, bring your dog to work? He said, just leave your dog at home. He'd find the dog and just bought it to training. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, talent, talent wise, he, he ended up, got, he was at Lillishaw, uh, that Lillishaw School of Excellence, um, and he got expelled from there. Um, and he, he just fell by the wayside. But what a, I mean, a, a very, very talented boy. Very, very talented boy. But, um, you know, a waste, really. Brings mm -hmm. a whole new meaning to the word running doggies. <laughs> he, he, put, he put a stick in the ground he put a stick in the ground so the dog could run around it that, that's, that's what he did unbelievable oh I love that story already um, after England you went to Ireland Hong Kong Singapore uh, what made you decide to play in the Asian region money mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to lie. No, I think I think what what happened was um, I got fed up with each season going from club to club and going on trial and this that and the other and trying to prove yourself over and over again. And it was Sam, big Sam Allardyce, got me a got me the opportunity to go over to Limerick mm. um, as a player coach. So that's I, I in Ireland, Henry. Yeah, yep. yeah, that's yeah. yeah. Aware, I'm aware. <laughs> So um, I, I went and I went and, and took that opportunity, and you know I was happy there. Was looking to settle there, 
and totally out of the blue i got a phone call someone saying come to uh, come to hong kong so i actually thought that the boys were winding me up someone was winding me up so i, I hung up the phone i got a phone call back i said look give me your number i phoned around a few people to find out if i could find anything out nothing um and in the end it was it turned out to be true so yeah I, the next thing i knew i was i was on a plane on a on a wednesday or a thursday trained on the friday played a game on the saturday so in hong kong that was it that was me me move over there but it, it was driven it was driven financially there's mm-hmm. how did, how did that the, how did the debut go uh we lost on penalties oh, oh. it was an important game then <laughs> uh, it was a it was a cup game yeah it was it was a cup game i scored my penalty so you though. get you get <laughs> you get flown down <laughs> minimal training go on to play a cup match the next uh two days wow <laughs> now that's as you get to know mace as you get to know mace better you'll realize that's the sort of circumstances he flourishes under all right so next circumstance singapore <laughs> well, uh, <coughs> you ended your footballing career in singapore um what was it that really attracted you to play in singapore other than financial uh your financial incentives uh, well, well, you, it, and it eventually settle down there, there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, it was it was pure and simple it was it was my wife she's singaporean so she mm. i met her when i was in hong kong she moved back to singapore um and that was the only reason i moved to singapore i was lucky mm. that i managed to get a club when i when i moved over here um managed to play for a little while but then obviously had to uh, retire because of the knee injuries so mm. it just became too much too much pain too many problems and the doctor said, if you want to walk when you're a little bit older, suggest you stop. So I had no choice. Mm. Um, well, um, do you have a favourite memory that you can share with us about your playing days? Oh. No. <laughs> no? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I mean, obviously, obviously, it's always good when you, when you have success. Um, yeah. Um, when you when you win things, and you know, I've been lucky enough to to win a couple of trophies here and there. Mm. Um, but no, I mean, making making my debut for Exeter, as daft as it sounds, that was a that was a, a nice little milestone. Although that we lost that one as well. But I must be honest, if I was going to say anything, I did enjoy my time when I played at Preston. Um, mm-hmm. I actually felt like I belonged there. It felt like the right fit for me, the right club. Um, unfortunately, it got cut short. But what to do? It was and, uh, that was a shame. And how did your debut go there? Because you've not got a great record by the sounds of it. Uh, uh, we won that one, yeah. five, <laughs> five, t- five, two at Scarborough away. Do you have any regrets, Mace, from your career? No, wouldn't change a single day. Wouldn't change a single day. Mm. Perfect. Because, you, I mean, there's things I'd do differently, don't get me wrong, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't, I, I don't regret anything because life's about decisions and if you make the decisions, you've got to stand by your decisions that you, that you make. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't regret anything. And uh, before, before you made another big decision, you also went into punditry. Um, how did you get yourself into the business, the industry? <sighs> um... I'd started actually doing some when I was at Stockport um, mm. when I was in the squads and they were filming the games and I ended up doing some of the commentary on that with, with the commentator. When I moved to Hong Kong, the um, Star Sports were there yep. uh, and I ended up just doing, doing games there for them, doing games for the uh, Hong Kong TV as well. And then what had happened was as time went on, um, I was comfortable doing that, doing World Cups, doing Euros, doing lots of matches and everything. And then when I moved to Singapore, it was it was a bit of a stroke of luck, really, because what had happened was ESPN had joined up with Star Sports and they'd opened the offices in Singapore. Mm. And they'd just got the contract for the Premier League throughout the whole of Asia. So all of a sudden, I got asked, to would I be going in? Would I, would I mind going in to, to do a, you know, a... A trial run, as it were, you know. So I said, "Yep, no problem." Went in, and obviously they had they had the Premier League, they had the Spanish League, they had all the Asian leagues, they had the Italian League. I mean, they literally had everything, and it just went from there. Really, it just spiraled and escalated. So 
Yeah, I've been involved in that side of things now for, I mean, it's, it's a good 25, 30 years. Oh, yeah. Um, so I grew up to Paul Maysfield being in uh, ESPN News, uh, on that channel, uh, ESPN News channel, where you just go on loop every 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, and, lucky, uh, lucky you, Henry. Yeah. Uh, I do want to ask a question, though, which is, uh, what do you think was the best game you ever commentated on here in Asia? In Asia? Mm-hmm. I'll t- I tell you what, th- this one will take a lot of beating because I was there, and there's a fantastic story behind this as well. I was in, here. I was we in, have time. I was in uh, I was in Bangalore, and it was an Indian national game, and India played um, Kajikistan, and okay. they basically they won the game. And this this victory, there was about twenty twenty five thousand people at the at the stadium, but we were live on site. Um, an amazing goal. If you ever get the chance, look it up. Sonal Chetri's goal in that is it, it's unbelievable goal. Hmm. Um, well, Henry well, can probably play a little clip in this when he edits it and puts it together. You can probably play yeah, a little clip of that video, it, right? It, it, yeah, I, I, I could do it. I could do it. You will do but it. <laughs> we, 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 were, we were pitch side before the game. Then we had to go up and do the commentary inside. But because the AFC have strict rules that you're not allowed to have anybody pitch side within 15 minutes of kickoff time, the AFC match commissioner came over and was kicking off. And he was about to jump in front of the cameras to, to get us off the pitch because we were standing pitch side doing this piece, which, which was up until sort of 10 minutes before kickoff. And th- there was absolute murders over it. And we got into a little bit of trouble over that. But it was, uh, that's one game that will always stick in my mind. But that game was, uh, that was, it was an unbelievable atmosphere and an unbelievable game. Hmm. So being, there, being there as well actually helps. The I atmosphere think, like, must have been. I, yeah, I was just about to touch on that because I think listening to some of the things you've told me about the the Indian games that you've been there for commentating on, the atmospheres have just been incredible, right? Oh, I, I mean, it's it, the, the the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. I mean, you know, there, there was sixty odd thousand at the Salt Lake for one of India's games not that long ago, and if they if they ever went down and the in, the national team played in Kochi and then in um, Kerala. I mean, it, the the whole place would just be yellow, and it'd just be absolutely mad. There would be like forty, forty five thousand fans all going mad there. I mean, it's it's a hotbed. It's picking up. Um, it really, really is. But um, no, it just it just needs to to carry on going the way that it's going. All right, we move on swiftly to the main agenda of the episode, which is where we discuss a pressing issue an interesting, or an interesting piece with our panellists. And today, we got Paul Maysfield to tell us the story of Little League Soccer. So, Mace, uh, tell us how you stumbled upon the idea of starting Little League Soccer. Well, did you not listen to last week's show? Andy told you. <laughs> uh, well, I want to hear it from the man himself. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I was... I mean, I'd, I'd, like I said before, I mean, I'd always done coaching and I was always helping out with the centres of excellence wherever I played. I was, I was coaching, whether it was at Stockport, Preston, Birmingham. Um, but basically, when I, when I moved to Asia, obviously it didn't happen in Hong Kong, but in Singapore, because I was going to be settled here, I needed to start to look, particularly knowing that my knees were a little bit, uh, little bit dodgy. Mm. I needed to look for something that was going to make sure that you know, I had longevity and that I, I had a job. Um, so that was basically the reason for setting it up was to carry on playing for a couple of years and then set up the, the coaching school so that we'd have the ability to be able to um, to keep work. Did you always uh, see yourself going into coaching after retiring? It's all I ever wanted to do, Andy. I didn't really want to play, if I'm being honest. As much as I enjoyed playing, which I really did, um, I always wanted to coach. What was and it about coaching that, that grabbed you? Just the tactical side of it. I like, I like, I like that battle, the tactical side of things. I like to, to think things through. I like to see things. I like to deal with things. I like to do things like that. I mean, that's, that's obviously at a higher level. Um, Did you play like that? Did you play with that, that kind of um, thinking in your mind? Yeah, that's, Probably why, I, I mean, I, 
my first my first game for Stockport County. There's a lad called Danny Bagara was the head coach, and the ball's come to me, and I've opened myself up. I've tried to play a five yard pass inside, and the ball got cut out, and the gaffer's turned around and gone, "What you doing? What you doing?" Oh my god! So the next time, get the ball. I try to play a five a five yard pass forwards. It gets cut out. The gaffer's like, "What the? Do you think you're doing?" So I turned around. And I went, "Oh, what do you want?" He said, "Don't think." He said, "You get the ball, you boot it, and you chase it. That's all you've got to do." Okay, no problem. And that was what we had to do. So it was, I that for me. It, it's sometimes harder to play football that way than being free to, to have a free mind to be able to play the way that you want to play. Um, because when when the shackles are on, I mean, jo John Beck was another one. I mean, God, I, I played with some, I played for some some lunatics. I mean, he he used to get us to to knock 50, 60 yard balls into the corner and try and get them to stop in the corner so that people would run over and kick them out for a throw in, so we could throw the ball into the box and score from a throw in. He just everything was everything was set play centric. I've known a couple of coaches like that in my time. Oh. I think you know a few now as well. <laughs> um, I don't know what you mean, Henry. Please elaborate. Uh, <laughs> Please elaborate. That's, 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 that's going to be another time when we bring the coach in. Um, who, are you, who, are so you, who are you stitching up there, Henry? We're soon well, we'll find out. <laughs> we'll, we'll find out soon. We'll, we'll find out soon. Um, but we have, we, a, we, have a, we have a coaches meeting for the Little League coaches on Wednesday. We'll raise the point then. Yeah, we'll raise I the point then. Can I join that meeting as well, please? Because I would <laughs> really no like to see who's going to be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 like, I, like how, I like this little transition that we made uh, because we're talking about how it is in Malaysia now. How did uh, Little League Soccer Malaysia make its way here um, after Singapore? And not very far apart from each other uh, as well in terms of timeline. No, it was it was just a natural progression. Was just to, you know, if you you can't sit on a chair with one leg, so sometimes mm. it's better to have you know two or three different angles, two or three different legs, just in case one doesn't work. So, I think it was a natural progression. It was it was something to look at. It was looking to to build things and and to you know just give as many people as many opportunities as possible to to, to play football. I mean, the, the work that has been, up, been done up there now, particularly over the past few years by Andy and his team, is just, I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, I mean, it, it scares me when I go up there. It really does, because it's, it's unbelievable. Um, but it's great to see that, you know, the model up there that Andy's put in is, is working so well. The, the kids are out there, they're all enjoying themselves. The, the inception of that league, I mean, it, that's brilliant because it gives the opportunity for the kids to actually play and gives them a goal at the end of the week from training. Um, the, the, you know, the KL Cup, you've got the Special Cup as well in December that, that he holds. I mean, everything, it, it just, it's just going, going forwards and onwards and upwards there in Malaysia. And again, because Malaysia is a much bigger country, that was one of the other things as well was you start in KO, you never know where you could end up. Mm. So, you know, you can use KL as a base and go for it. I think as well, Mace has been completely vindicated in the decision to, to spread himself across the two countries there. I, I mm. don't think as of yet, um, we've had both the Malaysian company and the Singaporean company running on all cylinders at the same time. You know, they've been kind of a little bit out of sync up until this point. And I think that that's mm. the... The short to medium term uh, goal next is to is to try and get the two working a bit better together. There's yep. no other academy which is across both countries, um, yep. so we have to leverage that a little bit better. Get the two organisations um, running a bit more in sync and leveraging off of each other's resources. Uh, we have some fantastic resources on both sides of the water, um, and that for me is the logical next step. Um, and the, when we can get that collaboration going, then then there'll be no stopping us. So the Correct. the thing to the, 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 the thing to kickstart that actually is the coaches exchange program that you guys started uh, earlier in the year where you brought in uh, Coach Hakim from um, uh, Singapore, Little League Singapore and Coach Simon down from Little League Malaysia, uh, Little League Singapore. Um, Andy, uh, what, what gave you the idea of actually doing this apart from reaching that medium to long-term goal? Yeah, for me, um, these coaches work with their players every single day of the week. 
right? Mm. Um, be it for matches or training or whatever it may be. And we have a fantastic team of coaches here, as we do in Singapore. Um, yep. But kids get bored of hearing the same voice every every uh, every so often, over and over again. They get bored of hearing that. So I think when you have the opportunity to switch it up a little bit, um, I think that that is is the first um, kind of incentive to do it. You know, those kids get to experience a different coaching style uh, for a week. I think to make people aware of. Uh, other organize of our sister organization so that oh you've got a, a coach coming in from singapore that's that's pretty cool didn't realize you had a an academy down there that's great also means when we come together in tournaments there's that little bit of synergy between um players maybe because they know of the academy in in malaysia or singapore also the yep. coaches get to know each other a little bit better and also the parents uh it creates that kind of friendly rivalry like oh little league singapore must beat little league malaysia or vice versa you know? like, <laughs> that's do you see that do you see that rivalry base hey do you see that rivalry forming already no nah. nah. <laughs> i i i we're not, not there we're not there it will, it will, it will, it will, it, that will come with time and it's and it's right <laughs> it, it's it, it's Again, that that comes with time, and it, and it, it's a friendly rivalry anyway. Because I know that we would support, from Singapore's point of view, would support Malaysia if they were, if they were the ones going through to a final. If we'd been knocked out, and I know vice versa, the boys would be, you know, the same there. It's it's one big family. That's the, that's the joy and the, and the beauty of it. Mm. That's that's what I'm saying. Uh, that that synergy is not quite there yet. Like it just yep. so happens that when the Malaysia Academy has has been in hard times and struggling a little bit, the Singapore Academy has been thriving, and then it's kind of role reversal. And when you have them kind of out of balance, you can't have a rivalry. It's a bit yep, like yep. when Man City were in Division Two and Man United were in the Premier League. Those games were never really meant too much but now they're mm. they're fighting for the title together they all of a sudden mean so much more right and yep. it's a it's a bit a similar sort of concept until the two organizations get get balanced um and hopefully that's at a higher level rather than the lower level um yep. then that rivalry will come in and everyone will want to, to be the academy that comes out on top so it takes a little bit of time to do that and i think like i said that's the next step for us all right uh Mace, what were the obstacles that came with both Singapore and Malaysia? Were they same? Were they different? Uh, if they were different, what were what were the differences that I think you the faced? hardest the hardest the hardest thing was when we started up in KL was managing it. it was mm. trying to trying to keep a finger on the pulse there because obviously I was based down here and having to keep the finger on the pulse down here, um, yep. and that that was the hardest thing, and that's why Andy talks about the synergies about how there were a kilter where Singapore mm. was was a bit stronger on occasions than Malaysia and 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 it's been it's been like a yo yo. And like I said, it's only sort of the past sort of four four or five years where everything has sort of got on track up there, um, the way that we'd like it. But it was I mean I think I mean Boyan I think Boyan was a was a key as well, bringing Boyan in because that gave us some credibility. Um, that was what? 15 years it's got to be 15 it's got to be longer than that hasn't it more, more than that yeah yeah it's got to it be about, uh, it's got to be about 18 arrived, years i think he arrived in 2002 if i'm not mistaken i mean i i, I played with Boyan down in singapore and and i'll never forget i mean i i, I was at my wit's end up there and i was in social social down in bangsa and I was, I was like, I, I, I walked outside, found him, and said, "Come, come over and and head this up and run it for us." And in the end, a little bit of negotiations, he did, and you know, he gave him a, a platform to kickstart for himself as well, which is good. And it's it's great mm. for us as well because he's always going to be part of the family, part of the history. Um, when you look at what he's gone on to achieve with Malaysian football in particular, um, he's been fantastic. So. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just it, it's just interesting. It's just interesting the way that everything's going to play out and transpire over the next uh, over the over the next few years. Yeah, I I agree with you on that. Uh, and and speaking on the same vein as well, uh, you met Boyan Kurchich and then uh, sorry, not Boyan Kurchich, Boyan Hodak. I'm not even thinking I was thinking, who's that? Boyan I miss football. 
I really miss football, okay? I really miss football. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I really miss football. Anyways, boy and Hodak, and now Andy Johnston. How did Andy Johnston come into the picture for the two league soccer? Paul, Maysfield. I don't know. Ask him. Did you not? Did you not ask him last week? I don't want to ask him. I want to ask him. Uh, I want to ask you. He was. He was at school. He was at Alice Smith. He was only a young whippersnapper. <laughs> um, and basically, uh, it was we needed part-time coaches, uh, you know, because if, if I, it was a way. It was a way, and then he was coming back, and then he was away. And I think Andy did some part-time work for us here and there because Boyan needed some part-time people who he could trust, um, and that's why he'd spoken to Andy. So. Andy was great with the kids, you know. The younger kids give him the opportunity to earn a little bit of extra pocket money um, as, a, as, a, as an assistant, a helper coach. And, you know, fair play to Andy. When you turn around and look at what he does now and what he's in charge of now, I mean, to come from those small, small little kernels, as it were, to, to be in charge of everything up there, it's, I mean, it's unbelievable. It's remarkable. Yeah. So yeah. it, it it does happen, and dr- dreams can come true. <laughs> I, 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 I just, I just <laughs> want to add add a little bit onto that as well because um, how it happened, Boyan was uh, was coaching the school team, um, right? And he had obviously um, seen something in me. He made me the captain of the team, um, even though that was the first time I'd ever played outfield because. Like, like I said in last yeah. week's show, I was a goalkeeper. Yeah. When I moved to Malaysia, I didn't tell anybody I was a goalkeeper. Um, so I played outfield and, and he made me captain. And then uh, I remember uh, he asked me after that whether I was in, interested in doing any coaching with, with young kids. And I said, yeah. And a bit like, a bit like Mace, um, you know, obviously to a much lesser extent, my, my professional football career never took <clears> off <throat> for me, right? Never happened. And I... I quickly develop much more interest in coaching than actually playing the game like even playing for for the school teams or socially I was more interested actually to get down and do the coaching sessions and uh, I remember the first session I did it was after school and Boyan had given me a, a lift from the school training session to the to the coaching session and I felt like out of a professional sense I should ask him how much I was getting paid and I asked him and this was, again, back in 2002, his level of English was not fantastic. Uh, <laughs> and I had no idea how much he told me I was going to get paid. But I just went, oh, okay, cool. Um, no idea. And I just went along by the, by, uh, and did the coaching. And I think like three, mo- three months or so after I had been doing the coaching sessions, he asked me to put in an invoice or fill in a timesheet or whatever it was. Um, and I, I, I filled it in as best as I could remember. Um, and it was only when I got that first paycheck I found out how much I was getting paid, <laughs> and it was, yeah, and it was, it was nothing. But it was um, not never about the money. I was enjoying it. I was learning what has now turned uh, into be my career, um, and it was a fantastic time of my life. And um, after I finished my schooling in Malaysia, I, I went back to the UK to do university. But mm-hmm. any time I had a, a semester break, I came back to Malaysia, and it was. Um, much the same as Mace's experiences arriving in Hong Kong, I would I would land and straight away, Boyan, I'm I'm back in Malaysia. What have you got for yeah, me? Give me some and, sessions. And, yeah. and I would just, you know, my my parents often didn't see a lot of me whilst I was whilst I was back <laughs> because I was just just off doing as many coaching sessions as I could. Um, <laughs> and that that was the first time uh, money became a factor. Not that it was important or so to me, but. Um, I did as many hours as I could uh, to number one learn my trade and number two to put some money in my pocket to go back to university with and um, I have I managed to avoid picking up uh, needing to pick up any sort of jobs whilst I was at university um, by having that little bit of of cash that I was earning from the coaching whilst I was back and it was the first time it made me realize uh, I I could actually make some money from this right Uh, Mace what was it about Andy that gave you the trust to push him to where he is today in the Little League setup? Trust. Trust him more than you imagine. Mm. And, and that's true. He knows. Okay. Hmm. All right. 
uh, that that brings us to that was a, that was a short answer. You were expecting a long waffly one, weren't you? I I was I was I was actually thinking of that, but because that because of that, I know you have a few stories that both of you guys share about each other that uh, you will never forget. It could be Don't good. Know what it could you're be bad. About. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, so I'd like for you to share, Mace, uh, of a story about Andy doing Lithic days. No, I actually can't any. think of any. Is that too many to think of, or no? I, 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 I can't, I can't really think of any. He's, he's no, he's just sensible. That's the problem. <laughs> he's too sensible. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm the idiot. That's, uh, that's the, that's the, that's the worrying part. Because I know oh, what no, he's going to. you gonna, just gave weapon to Andy again. Uh, again, well, my he's, brother. He's going to bang on. He's going to bang on about a load of things. And and I tell you what, <laughs> he's, he's right. And it could be anything from Epo to fried chicken to to football <laughs> matches to it, 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 listen. It, it could be anything. Trust me. I, I'm, okay, I'm, then. A, I'm a little bit sidetracked purely because, again, I know my brother's listening to this call and to hear the words come out of Mace's mouth that I'm too sensible, I know Ian will be cracking up listening to this. Uh, <laughs> that won't make a lot of sense to him. <laughs> but I actually I actually have two stories that pop to, uh, pop to mind. Um, okay. What would you like to hear? There's a story about how uh, Mace nearly got me fired and there's a story about how we first met. Which one do you want to hear? Uh, the story about you first met sounds a little bit boring now. Uh, we've got a few... Set, oh, you're quite sensible. So I want to oh, know that I sensible know, side know, of you that almost got you fired. I, <laughs> I want to know that sensible side of you that almost got you fired, Andy. So you want to no, know no, where... No, how no, 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 no. Go, go, go to the other one. Trust me, it's better. It's a better story. <laughs> okay, fine. If we've got time, uh, we maybe might, we circle we might back have... for the other. Sorry? If we've got time, maybe we circle back for the other. But which one are you going for, Andrew? Let's go with the one how you met... Uh, okay. How how yeah. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I touched on, I touched a little bit on it last week. <laughs> I'm not gonna get I'm not gonna get through this without cracking up uh, every time I, I tell the story. Oh. It just, just I'm gets crying. <laughs> but <laughs> but I told the story last week about how um, I started playing for this uh, men's social football team. Um, right. And uh, it was it was one of my first games that I played for them, and it happened to be comprised mainly of my school's teachers at that time. Mm. And I remember I got I think it may even have been the first game I was ever asked to play for, and I got told the kickoff time as say it was like three o'clock, and uh, I turned up at two thirty, and nobody was there. I was the only person there, and I was like. Uh, maybe someone's on a wind up I thought like maybe my, my school teacher had been winding me up he was the one that was running the team uh, so I waited there and I waited there and it gets to like 2.50 and there's still no one there no opposition none of our players nothing <laughs> I'm like okay uh, and because I had got there at 2.30 thinking I was running late so I'd been driving like a madman to get there anyway um, and then it gets to about 5 minutes to 3 and this one car pulls up and I'm not joking, there was about 10 people piled out of it. One of them being Mace. <laughs> and he'd got a lift from his teacher. And was, that was our team. Our team had turned up in one car plus me. That was basically it. Matt, and, Matt's um, Volvo. Yeah, yeah. Um, Matt Wood. <laughs> good, old, good old Matt Wood. I wonder if anyone's listening to this podcast who knows who Matt Wood is. Uh, that, would be, that would be great oh. if that would get to him because he was an absolute <laughs> legend. He was the PE teacher at the school at the time and um, uh, running the team on the weekends. Uh, not taking it all that seriously, I might add, but it was good times. Anyway, um, we play the first half and, and Mace was on the bench for the first half. And just before the, the halftime whistle, um, somebody puts in a hard late tackle on me i didn't react too too great to it bit of bit of uh colorful language was used uh got a little bit heated and the ref decides to blow up early for the for the half time so we go off um half time and and mace pulls me to one side and bear in mind as you touched on earlier he was like the face of espn at the time so i was a, yep. i was a little bit in awe i was like oh uh mace is gonna have a word obviously knew his playing uh history and stuff pulled me over and he's like look the only reason that guy's put the tackle through you is because you've been turning him inside out all game just keep your head keep your composure don't do anything rash just keep doing what you're doing and you're going to come out on top if he goes through you again just smile at him try to shake his hand and take the free kick that would be the best payback you can give him i was like oh okay 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 that's that's really great advice anyway matt wood manager of the team 
brings uh, <laughs> Mason at half time to play alongside me, two centre midfielders. Within the first 30 seconds, this same guy that had gone through me before me at half time absolutely side Mace down. All right? And I was like, oh, going to see the, the plan in action here. Mace gets up, you little da da da. <laughs> just <laughs> swearing, his, swearing his mouth off at this guy. Uh, and I was just looking at him like, Oh, so much for staying calm then. That's how the game's going to be. And we ended up playing the rest of the match uh, in a more aggressive manner, I would say, to what he had advised me um, uh, to do. So great advice. He didn't necessarily stick to it, um, but I did remember that for, or I tried to remember that when I continued my footballing career after that. So <laughs> it was an interesting meeting. All right. Um, I, I, I actually... Henry's lost. <laughs> don't talk about badminton <laughs> so I, I i took up 80 percent of your story and uh my uh my computer decided to hang on me while andy was telling the story but i heard most of it yep i heard most of it uh but don't worry about it listen listen to the podcast yeah, That's I'll great. listen to the podcast. I'll listen to it when, I, when I'm editing. <laughs> thankfully, everything is still moving. So I'm actually very thankful that nothing, ah, fingers crossed, nothing happens. And then Ian's on the back end trying to rec uh, recording this one as well. Oh my gosh. Um, so I don't think we have time for the second story. I'll find out from you when you come down to Malaysia, Mace. I want to hear that story really, really much uh, about how Does, Eddie okay, gets I'll, uh, I'll summarize, I'll summarize it's a, it's it really two, It's a two-second story. All right. It's basically... basically it was when I was, um, I was, I was coaching uh, full-time for Little League. This was after I'd finished university. Boyan was still the head coach, and we had a, a, a summer camp on. And Mace had come down as the, as the special guest to, to appear for the kids and what have you. And um, Mace had asked me to pick him up from the hotel in the morning of the, the camp. So I picked yep. him up uh, and take him to the camp, and we, uh, he gets to coach the kids and, and answer questions from them and, and what have you. Anyway, I picked him up. It was from the Eastern Hotel in PJ. And we got stuck in the worst traffic you could possibly imagine. Cut a long story short, we get to the, to the camp 30 minutes after the training started. Oh, no. Boyan pulls me to the side. I, I thought he was going to smash me around that car park. Uh, he was not impressed. You got Mace in the background going, no, no, it wasn't his fault, Boyan. Mace, please go over there. <laughs> he just carries on talking about it. I thought, it was gonna, I thought that would be the last time I ever worked for Little League. I really did. Because uh, it's one thing that, that Boyan just uh, wouldn't stand for. And funnily enough, it's one thing that I can't stand for now as well. It's, it's people being late for coaching lessons. It's the one thing that you have to do is get there on time. Yep, it's just correct. one of those things. I'd pick, pick, pick Mace up in plenty of time or what I thought was plenty of time. Completely underestimated the traffic. Uh, ended up being 30 minutes late. To this day, it's the only time I've ever been late for a coaching session. Um, so... Whether it was my fault or not, I guess I learned my lesson. What did What did Boyan say to you? Uh, you definitely you could not repeat. You don't want to know. <laughs> yes. You You would be editing for a long time if I repeat. Okay, I. You know what? I'm not going to dig well. myself a hole. I, I'm not going to dig myself a hole. We're gonna We're gonna go on to our final segment of the show, which is called Ask Soccer Sixty, where we bring you guys questions from social media uh, but this time we got our coaches to send us the questions instead uh, so thank you so much to the coaches for listening in and also giving your your input on the show and also your questions so your first question you guys um i think this is going to be for um mace first mace gareth davies asks who was the best manager you played for and why best manager yeah uh, Fred Davis, he was my youth coach f at Birmingham City um, and he taught me how to be a player. He taught me how to be a right back and he did it in a very, very quick time. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have had a career in football. <coughs> mm -hmm. um, I think this is for both of you guys. I just thought I would throw this in. Uh, Viru Senten put in, I think, for Mace. But Andy, you can put in your input as well. Um, Newcastle is set for a takeover. Who do you think will manage the club under the new owners? Blimey. I, I, I read somewhere that it's, there's a bit of a wobble on the takeover now. No, yeah. I was reading that yesterday, I think. So yep. um, I think they'll leave Bruce there just as an interim as, uh, for the time being. But then I think that maybe they'll change it. Maybe someone like Allegri, um, they'll, get, they'll go top, top draw. Because if they do take it over, 
with the monies mm -hmm. that they have and at, at the disposal. Uh, they'll be getting the best players, they'll be getting the best coaches. I mean, money doesn't become an issue, so you can expect the best. All right. Um, next, Andy, do you have anything to add on to that? No, not much to add. Uh, I totally agree. I think whoever buys <coughs> Newcastle, whether this transaction goes through or we wait another six to 12 months for, for another buyer, um, they're going to come in with one intention. You know, and that is to, to turn Newcastle into a top, top club again. And to do that, you've got to oh, spend yeah. money, which includes spending money on, on the best manager you can possibly get. Um, there's so many positives going for Newcastle Football Club that it's a, it is a great opportunity if there's an investor with very deep pockets that wants to come in and, and splash your money about. Um, the sky's the limit. It really is for them. So basically, the answer is top draw. Don't, know, have, don't have a name yet. Pick, pick who you want. Mm. It's too it's too early to pick a name because you don't know whether it's going to go through. You don't know uh, what kind of intentions the um, the new owners are going to put down. You don't know uh, who they're going to put in place as directors of football and things like that. It is a bit too early to predict a name, I think. Right, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. Um, Mace, Shaz Wan Wong has a question for you. As a professional player, what do you hate the most? Lightness. Punctuality, seriously, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because if if ever we were late, if ever we were late, we get uh, we get fined. And right. I, I tell you something that 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 so that punctuality is one. But one thing that does get my goat is all this nonsense of people rolling around on the floor now, <laughs> and and diving. Oh my god! I'm, if they're uh, not a big fan of Neymar, I wish these people played in my day. I really, really do because it, it gives them something to roll around for. You really would. I mean, it's you, you touch a player now and it's forty-five rolls on the floor. I'm sorry, that's it's not football. It's not football. And that's and that's the thing that I want to kind of bring in over here as well to follow up is that in Asia you kind of see these tactics being used, especially towards the late of the game. How do you do? Well, it's you okay. It's okay yeah. managing a game and it's okay time wasting. I've got no problem with that. But I'm on about right. A simple challenge, and someone rolls over fifteen times on the floor, and someone, you know, and, and yep, you hear them yep. scream, and and you know, within within a minute, they're back on their feet, they're sprinting around, and there's nothing wrong with them. Mm. I saw the best right. solution to that ever in a in a Malaysia game. <coughs> I don't remember who the player was. I don't even remember what game it was, but somebody went down rolling around again 15 16 times to the point where they stayed down feigned the injury got stretched off got carried to the side of the pitch but they put them down on the stretcher in front of all the away supporters and the away supporters just start pelting him with bottles you've never seen a guy recover from an injury so quick in your life <laughs> back on that pitch before you know it so i think that's the solution um <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Should do that more. I like that because uh, it's a pet peeve of mine. And when I saw that, I was like, "Yeah, that's a that's a justified response. I like it." <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, final question for you guys, uh, for both Andy and also Mace. Why don't for this one? Why don't Mace go first and Andy will go second? Okay. Um, Simon Motika has a question, which is, "How do you see, or what would you like to achieve for the future of Little League, Mace?" Oh. Growth. Mm. Uh, I, I think I think the structure's there up in Malaysia. I think it's good. It's strong. It's solid. And just to grow and maybe branch out up there, give more kids the opportunity to play football. You know, in different areas, different districts. Go and do some charity stuff. You know, mm. get out and reach out into the kampongs. I know that Andy's looked at that before, where we've done some stuff for for sponsors, where we've managed to go out and. Um, and go rural and go and do sessions for kids, which is fantastic. Just take take the game of football to the people. That's mm. that's what I'd like to see up there. But I, I just want, I'd like to see Singapore catch back up with Malaysia as well. And like it, like Andy said before, have that synergy sort of on par, as it were, so that you know everybody can play off against each other. <clears throat> Andy, yeah, I think for me, uh, break it down into a, a more short term goal and a longer term goal. I think. Um, one thing we've done pretty well up here in Malaysia is having four different training centers for, for Little League. So by having a training center in Melawati, Bandaratama, University of Malaya and Setia Alam, 
we're able to reach some of those districts that that mace is talking about um, i think that we have a fantastic structure in fckl which is the elite running uh, system i think there's a little bit of a gap at the moment between what we provide at little league and what we provide at fckl i'd like to close that gap so that the transition from when you come into little league's development sessions uh, at the weekend becomes easier to go into the into the weekday setup um, mm. we only have one uh fckl set up at the moment so the establishment of another elite training base that trains midweek um, i think you can see that happening very shortly um, the development of more development centers so capturing some some different areas of kl uh, those are kind of short-term goals which i think we will see happen in the next 12 months um, longer term goals uh is purely focused on on building that relationship with Singapore. I think it's something that takes a long time. Mm. Um, I mentioned last week that since we had our uh, really big sort of crash in, in 2010, 2011 in Malaysia, yep. we, we've taken a decade to build it back up to where it is now. Um, mm. I think, it, you know, you have to start looking at a similar sort of timeline to really get that um, that friendly rivalry between Malaysia and Singapore. But I think that's something that we're working towards. Uh, right. I hope to see some sort of ties um, much earlier than that. But I think that, you know, in 10 years time, I would like to see, you know, that rivalry between Little League Singapore and Little League Malaysia, um, where they can have really competitive games. It become a big event. It potentially becomes an annual thing where we have a competition between um, the two of them. Um, yep. So, yeah, that's the kind of long term vision. Um, there's there's a many many different things that can happen between now and then uh one of the things i've i've loved so much with my time with little league so far is is the journey that has taken me on um it's not coaching and playing football are never a straight line of progression there's always ups mm -hmm. and downs um and i think that you have to either as a coach and a player i think you have to embrace that if you get too hung up on the peaks or the troughs <clears throat> you won't develop as you should um so, you know, we take the journey as it comes, but ultimately we're, we want to be, you know, somewhere up here in, in 10 years time. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, we'll see how it goes indeed. And that brings us to the end of our podcast. Thank you so much, Paul Maysfield, for joining us today. Uh, and Thanks, also, Hedge. yep, uh, give us your feedback. Send us some questions. <coughs> We'd love to hear from you guys. Don't forget to follow us on Little League Soccer Malaysia on our social media platforms at Little League Soccer MY on both Facebook and Instagram. Um, stay tuned for next week uh, where we bring in Vishnu Ne, who is also our coach and a professional goalkeeper. Until next time, this is Soccer 60. See you next week. Mm -hmm.